All right, so chapter chapter six, we're, we're gonna just go right into broker, uh, the broker cram session part two. It's gonna be chapter six through nine. Uh, most of it's about real estate valuation. Uh, so we're just gonna go over the basics. We're gonna understand the terms of appraisal and client and intended use, uh, difference between federal and non-federal related transactions uh, and stuff like that. And we're gonna just go all the way through the process of preparing CMA, um, et cetera. So, First of all, there is what is an appraisal and what is the purpose of appraisal? Well, so we're defining a problem, right? We're defining what we're looking for as value of property. We need to define what type of appraisal we want to do, right? Are we doing a comparative approach? Are we doing a cost approach? Are we doing an income approach? Well, it depends on what type of property we are valuating, right? So if we're valuing a, a residential home, for example, we're probably going to be using a sales comparative approach, comparative sales approach. Uh, if we're looking for investment property, we might use the income approach. If we're building a property, we might do the cost approach, right? Because we want to know we're insuring a property, we'll do the cost approach, right? So we're determining the type of value that's going to be estimated, and we're determining how to go about that appraisal based on what type of property it is. <clears throat> so that's, that's key, right? So 475, chapter 475, part one, has to do with real estate brokers and broker associates and the laws that fall under that, right? Appraising is included in the definition of real estate services that were performed. Real estate agents can perform appraisals. They have to abide by USPAP, which is the Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practices, and we, have, we can only do appraisals for non-federally related transactions, i.e. cash i.e. portfolio loans, stuff like that. If it has to do with some type of credit union, financial institution backed by the government, FDIC, or something like that, could be Bank of America, for example, we have to have an, a licensed appraiser do that. Licensed appraisers fall under Chapter 475, Part 2, right? And so the rules of the of the, the Florida Real Estate Appraisal Board, we have two different things going on here. We have, we have the Qualifications Board and we have the Appraisal Board, right? The Qualifications Board has to do with testing and examination of appraisers. The other piece, right, the, the Standards Board, right? We have the AQB, which is testing. We have the ASB, which is standards, of appraisals, right? The Appraisal Standards Board makes sure that we're practicing under the right guidelines, right? So qualifications, testing, standards, practice. It's the easiest way to remember that. We don't have to worry about that. And then we have this thing called the FERIA Act, right? The FERIA Act is the Financial Institution Reform and Recovery Act. So this is what's giving us this ASQ, the AQB, right? This has to do with federal relate, related transactions. All this stuff is intertwined. It has to do with appraisals. So if you see FERIA, think about appraisals. Think about standards. Think about qualifications. Think about real estate agents not able to perform appraisals if it's federally related. Think about real estate agents not being able to call an appraisal if we're not abiding by the USPAP. That, that's what we need to think about. When we hear FERIA, that's what we're going to hear about, right? Federal related stuff. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so then we have this concept, right? We have this concept of price and value and cost. Do you remember that at all? So first of all, we have a AQB, ASB. And then we have cost, price, and I, I'm doing it. And, and, value, and I'm doing this in a different color because it's part two, right? So part two talks about values again. Price is what we're paying for the property. Price is what we're paying for the property. Cost is what it costs to build the property, right? Or what I paid already for it, right? Back in the day, that was my cost, right? Or cost basis. <clears throat> value is appraised value. Right, so if we put appraised value with that, we know 
the difference, right? So if I'm buying a house that's listed at 450 for 440, my price is 440. 440, right? If it appraises at 490, the value is 490. If it costs 400 to build it, the cost is 400. So we just need to know which one is which, right? That that's the key. So then when we talk about value, and because this is the prime that we're talking about appraisals, we talk about value. There's all these different types of value. We have an assessed value, right? Assessed value has to do with what? Taxes, right? That's the one everybody hates because that's what we have to pay stuff, but it is lower than some of the other values. So that's a good thing. We have the going concern value, which is done on income property. Going concern is what we would normally get for it based on normal business on our day-to-day -day basis. That's what going concern value is. We have insurable value, which is what it would cost to replace it under insurance, right? We have investment value. What is this based on management practices, risk, everything else? What is this value worth? Or this value of the house. We have liquidation value. Well, liquidation value is what? Liquidation value is how I'm going to get a quick sale, right? Salvage value is lower than liquidation value. It's for a quick sale. We want to get rid of it as fast as possible, right? And then we have this one that we don't really talk about is the value in use. It says property based on specific use that may not represent the maximum use. Remember, we talk about highest and best use. So we might have agricultural property that's worth 600,000, but if we do a zoning, if we do a rezoning of it and we make it commercial, it might be worth a million dollars for example, right? So that would be value and use. The value and use is less as agricultural as it is, than it is if it's commercial. Good so far? Mm -hmm. Okay. So <clears throat> market value is what? So that's totally different. These other values have to do with how things are being looked at, like why we're valuing it a certain way. Market value is different. Market value is what? The consensus. You know, so it's right, the consensus between buyers and sellers, we call it meeting of the minds, right? So meeting of the minds, market value is consensus of interactions between buyers and sellers, right? So when I tell you I'm listing a house at $600,000 and you're only getting one showing a week, what I'm telling you is the market is telling us that it's overpriced, right? It should be getting three to five showings or whatever the case is, depending on the current economic situation, right? So if it's not getting three to five, then the market, the market is telling us we're not at the right price, right? That's the consensus of the buyer and seller. We're getting a lot of traffic, but we're getting no offers. What is that telling me? That's telling me that we are overpriced. The consensus is we're overpriced. So that's what market value is, right? That, that's how we define that. It says Fannie and Freddie Mac define market value as the most probable price that a property should bring a competitive and open market offer, basically. So if you're priced right, you'll get offers. If you're priced wrong, you're not gonna get offers. It's consensus of meaning and minds. Um, when I talk about supply and demand, right? What influences supply, what influences demand, right? So what influences supply? The great box says here, availability of, availability of skilled labor, construction, loans and financing availability of land and materials, right? Why? Because supply of land is diminishing, right? So as the diminishing supply of land on the beach, for example, we have higher prices, right? Because we don't have that, right? And demand is different, right? Demand is what we desire as consumers, right? Supply is, is it available, first of all? De <clears throat> excuse me. Demand is, are we wanting that, right? Because you might have a whole lot of supply in a distressed area of town that nobody wants to buy, right? Or you could have no supply where everybody wants to be, uh, I like to use Mandarin, right? <laughs> everybody wants to be a Mandarin with no supply, right? So what happens when there's a high demand and a low supply? Well, the prices go up, it's economics, right? So if variables that influence demand, price of real estate, right? So what happens, the price goes up, demand goes down, then we now are able to have a consensus of the market in that neighborhood, right? Will the income support the purchase, right? That's a big deal, right? Because you can't have demand if you can't support and qualify for that. This population numbers thing is really interesting because back in the day, you know, most families had four people or five people living together. 
Now there's a lot of single people buying houses. So there's actually like 1.5 people per home, right? So what happens if the number of people in a home goes down? We have a demand for higher supply. We need more supply, right? Availability of mortgage credit. So back in 2004, there was tons of mortgage credit available. And in 2009, after the crash, there was hardly any financing available. And now we're kind of in the middle, right? Now it's coming back, right? That's what they mean by that. Is the rates, are the rates okay? Are the guidelines strict or not? Those are, that's what they're talking about on mortgage credit. Consumer taste and preferences. Well, <clears throat> wood grain. Do you want wood grain anymore, right? Do you want granite countertops from year 2000 or do you want the new quartz that came out that's all sparkly today, right? Those are, those are consumer tastes and preferences, right? Back in the day, nobody used LVP. They used parquet flooring, right? And green shag carpet. Now it's not like, ooh, don't touch that, right? So that's, that's obviously influencing demand. Um, in our case, we say, okay, well, you can change that. So what happens then we influence the price. The price goes down, right? Good? Mm -hmm. Okay. So they have this principle of anticipation as well, right? It's based on what future benefit is this gonna create for the property. So let's say we have a property that doesn't have a pool, right? We can anticipate that if we put a pool in, it's gonna increase our demand, right? So are we putting the pool in and getting our value back out of it? No, but are we increasing the number of people that may buy it? Maybe, right? It depends on if they want a pool or not. Some people don't, right? Because higher insurance costs, liability, et cetera. If I want a pool, so yes, but for everybody, you don't want a pool, right? Substitution is when I can substitute one thing for another. So let's say you like coffee, right? Maybe you like Starbucks, but Starbucks is out, so I go to Dunkin' Donuts, right? That's substituting one for the other, right? Is it something that I can substitute for a valuation? Is this a cookie cutter neighborhood that has four different floor plans, can I substitute one floor plan for another? Well, the answer is yes, with some type of adjustment, right? Maybe the lot's bigger or smaller, maybe the view's bigger or smaller, maybe one has more upgrades or not, right? But that's this principle of substitution. We're gonna use a sales of comparison approach. And the sales comparison approach is how we're gonna determine a value in those type of neighborhoods. Um, increasing and decreasing returns, so, Increasing and decreasing returns would be, are we making money off our investment? You know, everybody says, well, kitchens and bathrooms. Kitchens and bathrooms are helping your value if we remodel it. Well, adding a pool would be a decreasing return, right? You're losing money. You're spending $100,000 on a pool and you're getting 50,000 back if it's a really nice pool, or you're getting 20,000 back if it's a crappy pool, or 10,000, depending on the area of town. It doesn't stay the same for each area of town. So we have increasing returns and decreasing returns. We have conformity substitution. So increasing decreasing. This conformity thing is really important. So conformity is why it's suggesting that properties are the values are maximized when everything is to the same type of functionality for a house. For example, if I have a neighborhood that has all 1,700 to 3,000 square foot homes on quarter acre parcels, they're all pretty much uniform, right? If I build a 3,000 square foot home on the end of the cul-de-sac that's on 14 acres, and everybody else is on a quarter acre that doesn't really conform. Our value for that 14 acres isn't going to be as much as if it was in a neighborhood with all 14 acre homes, right? So that's the principle of conformity. Uh, substitution, I didn't, I didn't put on the board, we probably should. Um, uh, and then we also have supply and demand, which A lot of the supply and demand stuff is like ninth grade. It, it teaches you, I mean, it's, it's, it's common sense if you really think about it, right? Um, 
So we have external economies and diseconomies, right? So external economies is what's in the area around you that's affecting your value, right? And a diseconomy would be the opposite, right? So you'd be losing money. Um, that could be on local or as far as national levels, right? So what helps the area? What infrastructure helps the area? I like to use the Lake Asbury area, right? Lake Asbury area is having an interchange cut through, right? Right now, the values are lower because the convenience level of the area, right? But once this state road goes through there, you're gonna have an easier way in, easier way out, more commercial property come in, so that external economy is gonna be positive because we're gonna have a lot more commercial, we're gonna have like a little town growing there, right? Right now, the values are depressed, but they're gonna go up at some point, right? That, that's basically what the concept is of external diseconomies and economies. You're not probably gonna see that. You might see how it's been best use. Which we know that if you change the zoning on a property, it may be worth more. It may be worth more as 60 undeveloped plats at 60 at, at half an acre than it is at 100 plats at a quarter acre. It just depends on on what the demand is for that neighborhood, right? So th those are the things you have to think about. Or it might be worth more zone commercial versus agriculture. This is what the concept of highest and best use is. Um, so for the appraisal, what are we identifying? We talked a little bit about this, but what are we identifying? We're identifying the customer, right? We're identifying the client, customer. We're identifying the intended use of the appraisal. Are we getting a loan for for residential property, for example, right? Once we intend, once we figure out the intended use and the intended user, then we can figure out what method is the best method for an appraisal. So we have a couple different ones, right? We have the sales comparison. We have the cost approach. And we have the income approach. We talked about what those were already, but based on what questions need to be answered and who the client is and the intended use of, we're going to figure out which one we should do, right? We're going to develop, we're going to determine the scope of necessary, right, to get a credible appraisal, and then we're going to figure out the appraisal and what the appraisal is based on this scope of work. So again, we're not going to get too much into that, but we're, we're looking at client, intended use of client. That's what we're looking at. Sometimes we have to make we have to make assumptions depending on the availability of comparable properties, right? So, if we're doing the cost approach, I'm, I'm sorry, the uh, sales comparison approach. So, what most appraisers do, and what virtually everybody does, as far as appraisals are concerned, is we're gonna we're gonna use some. Uh, conglomerate of these three approaches, right? And we're gonna weight the approaches based on which one's the most appropriate for that type of property. So we may do a sales comparative approach, but we may also do an income approach. And we're gonna reconcile this appraisal based on which one we think is most desirable for the type of property we are doing, we are appraising. So let's say we are appraising a four bedroom, two bath house in Mandarin where there's tons of resales and there's tons of comparable properties that we can substitute through the principal substitution. We're gonna do a sales comparison approach and we're gonna weight that heavily, right? It might be 80% of your appraisal. Well, we might take that we might understand that this is an investor and we do still want to do the income approach and see what the property is, right? So then we would reconcile that at say 20%, right? And the cost depreciation approach may not be anything. It, again, this is just an example, but we would weight the values, multiply them together. And, and there's a chart on page 182 figure 
or 6.3 that kind of talks about how to reconcile it. But basically you take the indicated value and you multiply it by whatever the weighted percent is and you get a value and you add all three values in this case together and that's what you get. So it's generally, it's to make the appraisal conform as much as possible, if that makes sense. We as real estate agents don't do appraisals. In this case, we would do a BPO or a comparative market analysis, which is similar. We're not gonna do an income approach on a comparative market analysis, right? We're not gonna do an income approach unless there's an investor that specifically asks for that, right? We're, we're gonna only stick to this comparative sales approach, and that's what we're gonna be tested on other than conceptual. Um, and, and something about value, I don't know why, I haven't seen it in here, but we didn't talk about obsolescence, right? So there's there's the external and internal obsolescence, right? So external obsolescence is something that's outside the property. It's something like a cell phone tower or a utility easement or uh, water tanks on the side of your house or a garbage dump in your backyard or something like that. Those are external obsolescence, right? They're gonna affect your value because the demand is gonna be less because of those items that are either eyesores or maybe there's a smell or a treatment plant, something like that, right? We have internal obsolescence or functional obsolescence, right? What is that? Functional obsolescence is when maybe there's a bedroom inside of a bedroom, right? Or maybe there's a bathroom where you have to turn sideways to get in the door to sit down, right? There's all these different things, right? Maybe there's a house that has no bathtub and three bathrooms and you have little children that you need to use a bathtub for, right? There's all these different things that could affect your value based on the functionality of the property. So when you say functional obsolescence or internal obsolescence, that's what that is. That, that, that's important because when you have your discussions with people in general, when they're selling your houses, you need to be able to explain that, right? So moving to chapter seven, it talks about income approach. It talks about sales comparison approach, talks about depreciation and our favorite things, PGI, EGI, Right, so what is the formula? So we have PGI minus vacancy and collection losses, right? Equals EGI, remember that one? Back to gross income, right? And then we're gonna take out the operations and maintenance and all that, and then we're gonna get net operating income, right? Minus, NOI, or minus OE, right? And we get NOI, right? Net operating income. And after net operating income, we're going to calculate our taxes. We're going to get before tax cash flow, after tax cash flow. Remember all this stuff? Mm -hmm. It's my favorite part of real estate is doing all these crazy calculations for investors, right? <laughs> um, good news is we don't do that very often. But you need to know the basic formula so that you can figure out the questions because when we get to the when we get to the closing statement, a lot of times for for this, not only are we going to do this for investment property, but we'll also do stuff for operations and everything else. So these formulas are important. This is more for investor analysis, but you're gonna have it for other things. So properties, when we talk about properties, we're talking about are properties homogenous or heterogeneous? Well, they're heterogeneous, right? Because even you could have the exact same house, you could have the exact same house, I'm talking about interior, exterior, upgrades, everything, but it's still not the same as the house next door. Why? Because the lot's different, right? The lot might be southwest versus south, right? Or something like that, right? It might be facing different. So when we talk about a site, and this is off the, the, the book itself, but when we talk about a site, we talk about situs, right? We hear this word site. Well, situs is basically referring to where we're at, where our location is, right? We might have the same house 15 doors down and it may be worth way different because there's a marsh view versus a lake view, right? Or there's a house in the backyard of that house versus a preserve, right? Th those things make a difference, right? So we have that, and then we have this concept of an arm's length transaction. Well, sometimes when there's a non-arm's length transaction, the house value is depressed, right? Because we're not wanting to pay deed stamps on the transfer of title, right? So where arm's length, arm's length means I'm not privy or I'm not 
a party to the transaction that may be related to somebody else in the transaction, right? I'm a real estate agent selling my sister's house. That's non-arm's length, right? Uh, I'm a mother selling to a son. That's non-arm's length, right? We want to make sure the parties don't know each other for the best value, right? But we have to know that when we're valuing property because we have to take that into consideration. Maybe this comp's not good because a mother sold to a son and they gave him a 30% discount, right? So what I like to say with that evaluation is throw out the outliers and usually don't have to worry about that. Likewise, if there's a foreclosure in the neighborhood and there's only one foreclosure in 28 resales, throw the foreclosure comp out because it's not a comp, right? The value is going to be different. So when we're looking at value, we look at these, these transactional characteristics, right? Is there concessions? What was the market conditions at the time? Is it severely declining or is it increasing, right, for example? Is there personal property involved in a transaction? Was there seller's concessions? Was there any other conditions of sale? Was it, was it that they let them lease it back for two months or maybe they gave them a better deal because of that, right? And is the location desirable or not? Right? These, are, these are characteristics of the transaction. What are the financing terms? Was there an assumption in today's market on a lower interest rate? Right? Is there seller contract? Is there seller financing? Is there a contract for D? Is it an FHA loan? Is it is it conventional? Did they pay six thousand in closing costs? Whatever, whatever the case may be, right? So we need to take all that into consideration when we're valuing property. So a lot of times you'll get a call from an appraiser, and the appraiser will say, "Hey, tell me about this. You know, was there concessions?" What is a concession? Concession is something in your closing costs. I'm giving you something of value so that you buy something at a certain price, right? Uh, I'm gonna use successive sales analysis. We'll talk about paired sales. We're gonna talk about that. Okay, so paired, yeah, we'll talk about paired sales analysis. So paired sales analysis, what is paired, paired sales analysis? And we'll go over this uh, EGI stuff when we get to investment more, but paired sales analysis. What is a paired sales analysis? This term we really didn't go over in class, but the paired sales analysis means this. I have subject property A, and I have two, I have two comparables. And one of the comparables is 330,000 and has a swimming pool. And the other comparable is $325,000 and has no swimming pool. We're gonna assume that the pool's worth $5,000, right? Everything else being equal, right? That's what a pair of sales analysis is. We're, we're taking two pair, we're taking a pair of properties. One has something and one doesn't and everything else is equal and we're coming up with a difference in value and that's how we're determining the value of said item, whether it's a screen porch, a preserved view, uh, a fence, whatever, whatever the case is, right? We're, we're, that's how we're figuring it. That's what paired sales analysis is. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm gonna worry about that. You have dollar and percentage price adjustments. So dollar that would be one an example of a dollar adjustment, right? Dollar adjustment would be, okay, we determine the price value is the price of the pool is five thousand dollars. The subject has it or the subject doesn't have it. We need to put it against the comparable, right? And we adjust the comparable value. We never adjust the subject value, right? And it's it's bad what, as ad. Bad as ad. Bad as like place. Nice, nice and slice. slice. Yeah. And this is and this has to do with a comparable, right? We always adjust the comparable, not the subject. So if the comparable is bad, we add to the comparable's value. If the comparable is nice, we slice it from the comparable's value to determine the price of the subject. And the comparative, when we say nice, nice is the comparable nice compared to the subject property. Is it better than the subject property? If it's better than subject property, they say CBS, right? Comparable better, subtract, right? If the comparable is worse, then we say add, right? Comparable is inferior, we add, right? I don't like that. I like bad as add, bad add, nice slice. 
normal sales price when I was coming out. Now, percentage adjustments are done not necessarily on comparable, but they're done on timing, right? So if I have a new construction contract that I wrote 12 months ago, and today's values are selling at this in the general area, then I need to adjust the appraisal based on time of contract. If we had a 20% increase in St. John's County last year, and it took me 12 months, then I need to increase my value by 20%. Or if it took us four months, increase it by 7%, for example, right? So we need to take that into consideration when there's a large adjustment based on a severely, a severely declining market or a rapidly increasing the market. Either one of those markets, we would have to take a time consideration to a percentage adjustment as well. Good. Cost approach. Same thing, right? Cost approach means it's the cost to rebuild. It's the insurable cost to rebuild, right? Well, what if plywood was $25 a sheet six months ago and $45 a sheet today? We would have to take that into consideration and we would do a percentage adjustment, right? So, then they have, uh, you don't ever hear this, but quantity survey method includes all the labor and materials and the indirect cost, right? Unit and place method means the appraiser calculates the cost of materials for label on each component of the structure, such as driveway, parking area, roof, et cetera, right? Um, and then there's this unit method, square foot or cubic method, which is the one we normally use, right? We usually use some type of square foot analysis and then adjust for improvements. Appraisers do that a little more in depth than we do, but that's pretty much it. And that's talking about re replacement cost. So what is replacement cost versus reproduction cost? Reproduction means, reproduction means I'm going to create this house exactly the same as the last house with the exact same materials. If I have plywood outside structure, I'm gonna use plywood outside structure. If I have treated two by fours, I'm gonna use treated two by fours that are pine or whatever the case is. Replacement cost will be, okay, I've got the treated two by fours, but I have to use OSB instead of plywood, right? It's a different material, it's a different price, but it's the same functionality. Reproduction will be plywood to plywood, Replacement would be plywood to OSB. Even though OSB is a type of plywood, it's put together like paper mache. Right? That's the difference between a replacement and a reproduction cost. Then we have this depreciation piece, right? Depreciation piece is more like for taxes. Most properties don't depreciate. Um, land never depreciates, right? It always appreciates. Trailers depreciate, right? Mobile homes, manufactured homes, they depreciate in value, right? Um, in theory, properties depreciate functionality-wise, right? Systems-wise. You have your four points or five points. You have your, your structural foundation. You have your plumbing, you have your electric, you have your roof. Right? These are these are things. You have your air conditioner, your HVAC system, right? These are things that depreciate based on how old they are. So sometimes we take that into to consideration, especially if the house is older, right? If the roof is older, what we're gonna do is take the effective age divided by the total economic life, and we're gonna figure out this reproduction cost or times of reproduction cost and replacement, and then we're gonna get this estimated total depreciation. Depreciation. We take residential property and we do it over how many years? 27 and a half. And commercial is what? 39. When we do depreciation, I just said land doesn't depreciate. Land does not depreciate. It's very important. Land is not used to calculate depreciation. So if you have a property that's sold for 500,000, but the land is worth 100,000, we're gonna do the depreciation calculation on 400,000. And we're going to add the 100,000 back in to get the total value. 
Be careful with that question. Be careful if they say office building or restaurant because you have to understand that office building or restaurant is commercial and you have to use 39 years. It may not tell you anything other than that. So that's why you have to be careful, right? Depreciation is very, very important. It's good for investment. It's also good for taxes. And they have this other thing called effective age, right? So they may tell you that the property, they may tell you that the property is 30 years old, but all the improvements are only five years old. So that makes the effective age only five years, right? So then you have to do the depreciation calculation based on not the standard number, but what the effective age of the property is. So you have to make sure that you understand that concept. So then we have our favorite things, right? We have gross rent multiplier. So this is the income approach, right? We have a gross rent multiplier and we have a gross income, gross income multiplier, right? Gross rent, GRM and GIM. And here's the thing with that, right? Gross income has to do with what type of given. Do you remember? like the income that's given. So gross rent multiplier is monthly and gross income is annual. Mm -hmm. So we have to be careful that we are pairing the right cons. It's the same calculation, but different, different multipliers, right? Sales price divided by gross monthly rent is your gross rent multiplier. You may be given annual and they ask for gross rent multiplier, so we know we have to take the annual divided by 12 to get the monthly, and then we can get the right gross rent multiplier. Likewise, you can be given the monthly income and ask for GIM, gross income multiplier, we have to multiply by 12 to make sure that we have the, grant, the annual income. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Sales price divided by gross monthly rent is the gross rent multiplier. Sales price divided by gross annual income is the gross income multiplier. Gross annual income times the factor that's figured out here would be the estimated market value of the property. So you can convert the equations either way. Just make sure you're getting the right answer for the right question. So if they ask for gross income multiplier, you know you have to convert it to annual income for rent. They're not gonna just trick you and not give you the rent. You're, you're gonna get the factor. You just have to understand you either have to multiply it or divide it by 12 or use it straight out depending on what the question asks. So the key there is read the question. Read the question slowly. Read the question, read the answers. Read the question again, and then figure it out from there, right? So that, that's that's important piece, right? Um, the next piece of it is, is the reconstructed operating statement. So this is where we're talking about PGI, and EGI, right? It says PGI times estimated percentage of vacancy and collection losses. So right here, PGI, potential gross income. So if you have 20 units at $400 a month, you know that you can bring in $8,000 a month, but 5% of that is going to be vacancy and collection losses. So you would take the 8,000 and multiply it by 5% to get your vacancy and collection losses. And then you would subtract that number from the potential gross income and you would get the effective gross income. So far, we're good with that, right? Mm -hmm. That's the easy piece. Now, the operating expenses might be an additional $1,000 for that, right? So then we would take the effective gross income minus out the operating expenses, and then we would get the net operating income. PGI minus vacancy and collection losses equals effective gross income minus Operating income equals net operating income. So if you're given three of those factors, you can figure out the rest of them, right? So that, that's the key there, that's the key. And they may say, well, they may not give you all of it. They may say, well, I'm just gonna get, I'm gonna give you the, the value and the monthly and the percentage of, of uh, vacancy. And then you've gotta figure it out, right? You've gotta figure out how many units, how much per unit, 
how much percent of vacancy, and then you can get the effective gross income, and that's how they're going to do it. That's how they're going to test you. On a broker exam, they give you a little bit more of a let me think through this question, right? It's not the same as a sales associate where you may just check the answer and be okay, right? Um, it's going to be more of a thought process because at this level, you should understand that if I'm given one factor, I should be able to figure out the other. And again, we can do a reconciliation of that appraisal, right? We can do that based on the three approaches or two approaches or however we're gonna do that, right? So that's basic. That's basically how it works for that piece of appraisal. Then we get over to our CMA, right? So CMA is what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis as a real estate agent, right? We have comparative market analysis and we're usually using one of those one of those methods, sales comparison approach, typically, and we're preparing a CMA and an opinion of value, right? This is an opinion of value. This is not an appraisal. A CMA is not an appraisal. Can we do an appraisal as a real estate agent? Yes, we can do an appraisal as a real estate agent. We can do it if it's non-federally related and it conforms to USPAP. But if we are doing a market analysis for a property, we don't call it an appraisal. We call it an opinion of value. Same thing as a broker broker price opinion. Broker price, price opinion is a little more detailed than a CMA, but they're essentially the same thing. One's just more in depth than the other. There's a chart figure 8.1, it talks about approaches to value. For a CMA, we're doing a market approach, right? For BPO, we're gonna add the income approach. For a appraisal, we're gonna add a cost approach to it. So appraisal is gonna take all three. BPO is gonna take two, right? We're gonna use different types of properties. Are we gonna use expireds? We're not gonna use expireds on broker price opinions, right? Because we want to see what's going on right now. Um, CMAs do use expireds because we wanna see where the overpriced piece was, right? Um, I always say try to stay away from active pending all that. You wanna stay, because we don't know what the active selling for, right? So we wanna, we want to give the best value, so use closed, Use expires for a CMA. Um, you can use active to show trends, but don't use it in the actual valuation of the property. Right? So again, it says talks about CMA. Currently on market, recently sold and expired. Again, currently on market is nothing more than an indication of what the current trend is in the market. Expires are saying what sold for what didn't sell right so that's too high right and then recently sold is what the projected sales price of the new house or the, the new sale would be right and we have elements of comparison location the size of the lot the shape of the lot is it on a cul-de-sac for example is it a pie shape is it it doesn't have 100 feet of road frontage or 20 feet of road frontage Hopefully it doesn't have 20 feet of road frontage, but <laughs> doesn't mean there's not properties. And it's all the stack at mine. Okay. Right. <laughs> landscaping, what kind of landscape do we have? Do we have a nice Arizona landscape with cacti and rocks and no grass to water and all that? Do we have coastal landscaping or do we have Bahia grass that's half dead and bushes that haven't been trimmed in six years? That makes a difference, right? Because curb appeal affects value, right? Construction quality, is it? Concrete block, is it frame, is it vinyl siding, is it hardy board, is it stucco, is it brick, right? That's what we're talking about. What type of style is it? Is it traditional? Is it a villa? Is it a zero lot line? Is it a ranch style home? Does it have mansard roof? Is it Tudor? Is it any of these things, right? We need to figure out what type of style it is, design. How old is the house? Are we gonna use brand new homes that are in this neighborhood to compare against a home that was built in 1960? Well, the answer is no, right? We're not gonna do that because the styles are different and the age is different and we would have to depreciate things and add it back in, it's too complex. Don't use new construction next door to existing construction for value. Number of rooms, bedrooms, bathrooms, kitchen, etc. We need to take that into consideration. Do not double dip. If you're doing a square footage analysis, don't 
add 3,500 for the extra bedroom, for example, right? You can't double dip to increase your value. It's a common mistake that's made. Now we hit the comparable, right? Better, better subtract if it's inferior add. I like nice slice, bad add. What you're gonna be given on the state exam is garage area, right? You're gonna be given an area in the garage that says, this is this dollar per square foot. Maybe the garage is $40 per square foot and the house is $60 per square foot. Calculate the cost to rebuild. That's what they're gonna tell you. So understand that you have to take that out. Or they might give you a patio, a front porch, and a garage. Those are all at one value, and anything under air condition is at a different value. So just make sure you understand how to separate those out, right? That's it for that piece. And then we have our favorite thing, fundamentals of business appraisals, which we all love because it has to take accounting into consideration, has to take functionality of business, has to take going concern value, are we looking at liquidation? What are we doing with this commercial piece of property? Are we selling a restaurant? Are we closing the doors, selling off the equipment, and opening up as something else? All these things make a difference when you're doing business appraisals. We have to establish some type of date and we have to analyze this data based on a date. We're gonna look at we're gonna look at balance sheets, we're gonna look at income statements, right? So one of balance sheet and income statements, one's at 30 days and one's, one's an immediate snapshot, right, of the property or of the financials, financials of a company at a certain time, right? So we have to estimate things. We have to, we have to report our assets. Assets are reported at cost, right? And then we have to look at what type of accounting do they have. Do they have accrual-based accounting? Do they have cash-based accounting? Are they using first in, first out? Are they using last in, first out, right? Last in, first out will show negative or lower profits, right? Because the last in, first out assumes that your prices are higher when you purchased it. If you use first in, first out, your prices are lower and you're gonna have greater profitability based on how you're selling things, right? Those things are important when you're evaluating a business. Or are we doing some type of dollar cost averaging where we are averaging what the cost are over time. Maybe we're buying 100 pallets of beans every month over the year. We can take the average cost of that because we're doing consistently and we can use that as our valuation as well, right? All these things make a difference, right? Sometimes they go to the level of identifying each box or each piece that they've purchased and putting a price on each one of those things. That's more like, I see that in more stock, right? Um, so these are inventory costing methods. Uh, we understand cash versus accrual, right? Cash, cash basis means, we talked about earlier, cash basis means that we're getting paid or we're booking this at the time we're receiving or, or passing out the money. Right. Accrual base means we're doing it based on contract for a future date. And we're going to calculate finance. We're going to analyze these financial statements. We're going to we're going to look at ratios, right? We're going to look at current ratios and quick ratios. Do you remember what that is? Current ratio is current assets divided by current liabilities, right? Remember that? Mm -hmm. Page 248. Right, so quick ratio is what? More conservative, right? Current assets by current liabilities. Minus your, 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 your quick current ratio is current assets by current liabilities, but the quick ratio removes the inventory piece out of it, right? Mm -hmm. So it's more conservative. So we need to know what they're doing. What is the inventory turnover ratio? Well, how much inventory do we have? How much are our sales, right? That's how we're gonna calculate that. Cost of goods sold, 
and dividing it by the ending inventory, we're going to get this inventory turnover ratio. It's important to understand that because maybe the industry standard is we get four turns a year on this inventory, right? But maybe you're getting six turns a year. Well, that's good, right? But maybe you're getting two turns a year. That's bad, right? So we need to know if we're at a benchmark. We need to know if we're above or below the benchmark for the, for the type of industry we're in. That's important, right? We have debt to worth ratio. Well, that's pretty easy, right? We're, when they say you have a higher debt to worth ratio, how much debt do you have to what property or values, value of the business is, right? How much is your debt? Do I have $200,000 debt versus $600,000 in worth, right? The higher the ratio, the greater financial leverage, but it also gives you higher risk. Net profit on our, uh, our capital, you're probably not going to see that. Um, there's a formula on page two, 249 about that as well. Uh, basically, what's the what's the, uh, the owner's return on investment? Right? How much have they invested over how much is, is coming in? Uh, let's see here, you're talking about adjusted balance statements. You're not going to have to adjust any balance statements on this state exam. So, comparative sales on figure 9.7 talks about selling prices versus annual sales, what the net income is, what the annual sales ratio is, and selling price net operating income over net operating income. All these things are going to make a difference, and you're going to do calculations if you need to do it for appraisal. You're not going to see this on the exam, but this is just kind of telling you how to do the value. You're not going to see this on the exam, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Now, the problem with valuing business is that you have you have a lot of intangible type value, right? You have intellectual property, you have separable intangible apps, assets like franchising and copyrights and leasehold benefits, right? But you also have this inseparable intangible, right? where maybe the business owner has been in charge for 30 years and has a great rapport with all of the customers, right? Well, if they were to sell to somebody else, they don't have that person anymore. Well, that person has been removed. Now the sales may, may falter because that person is gone, right? They call that goodwill, right? They call that, we can't give that back because that's this person, right? It's an intangible asset, right? Business goodwill can also be the reputation of that service. So if you if you change and you have new ownership and you change the name of the company, even though it's the same company, there's value that could be lost, right? Those are the things that you need to worry about. So firm reputation, owner reputation, product quality. So there's personal business, personal and business goodwill. Personal goodwill will be my personal contribution to this, right? Business goodwill will be the reputation of the firm or the quality of our merchandise. So maybe it's a Chinese restaurant and this owner has great food quality and the next guy comes in and changes where they're buying their supplies from and now that business goodwill has diminished. Does that make sense? And that's pretty much it for, for nine. So the, the ratios on figure 9.8 is really good. Quick ratio. Current ratio, current assets over current liabilities. Quick ratio is current assets minus inventories divided by current liabilities. Inventory turnover is cost of goods sold divided by any inventory. Debt to worth liability divided by net worth. <laughs> and net profit divided by total capital would be net profit to capital. Anytime you say ratio, it's some type of division problem. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's it for part two, don't focus too much on the business valuation piece. There's not going to be a lot of that on the state exam. It's, that's why I don't want to really get in depth on it because you need to focus on things that are going to, you'll see this one. You'll see this one. I promise you. Just know that quick takes inventories into account.